Hi, my name is Michael Andrew, and I'm about to give you a free tutorial on the Fuji X100V. First, we have to give a shout out to Lens Pro to Go, who is our sponsor for this video. They provided the camera that I used to demonstrate. Paul has always been super supportive. So if you want to try out the Fuji X100V or any other camera or lens, give Lens Pro to Go a shot. Maven 10 will save you 10% at checkout. If you are coming from another camera system and you're an experienced photographer, you're probably going to want to check out our table of contents. If you hit Command F or Control F and type in the topic that you're interested in, you should get a highlight next to the time code. You click on the time code and it'll take you to that part of this course. If you're brand new to photography and this is your first camera, I have to give you a word of warning. This video is not going to be enough to help you take consistently great images. So if you are in this category, I would strongly recommend my digital photography crash course. It's really designed to get you through the basics as quickly as possible, where you will learn things such as shutter speed, aperture, depth of field, lighting, composition, in the application of different features according to what you are shooting. In any event, we have a tremendous amount of information to cover, so let's get started. There are a couple things that I want to go over before we get into the main part of the lesson, and it's just familiarizing ourselves with the physical controls of the camera. If this is your first camera of this kind, it's gonna be really confusing. One of the most common questions I get are, where are the mode dial? You know, there's no mode dial on Fuji cameras, and I'm about to explain all this now. Something you'll notice is that there are several dials that have a red A. So there's a red A on the lens. We have a red A on this dial. And if you look real carefully, we we'll also have a red A right there on the ISO control. A on Fuji cameras, the red A stands for automatic. So when we have that feature turned to the red A, what we are doing is telling the camera to make the decision for us. Now this ring here is the aperture control wheel. It determines the diameter of the opening of our lens that we're shooting with. F2 is very wide open, whereas F16 is a very, very small aperture, very, very tiny. So what those numbers mean is that we determine the size of the aperture. So we're physically telling the cameras opening the size of the lens when we have it on a number. And when we have it on red A, we're telling the camera to make the decision for us. So this, this beefy control with the two notches on the side of the lens, this is how we control the opening of our lens. This style here with all these numbers is the shutter speed. So if we go to direct control, and we move it to one of these numbers, what we're telling the camera is to use the shutter speed as a fraction. So if I turn it to 250, I'm really telling the camera to use a shutter speed of 1 250th of a second. If I continue to rotate it and come all the way to the red A, I am telling the camera to make the decision for me on the shutter speed. ISO control, is in this little window here. And this is so cool because it reminds me of some of these older cameras that my dad you know, had as a, as a you know, young man. You would lift this control up and you could rotate and you get a little preview in this window that you can see the ISO. And the ISO is the boost of the camera. We'll be talking about it more in the exposure mode. But when this is pointed to A, we are telling the camera to make the decision on ISO for us. So based on the combination of these numbers and the red A, that determines the mode that we're shooting in. So I'm going to turn this to 400. So I've set the ISO. And in this case, where we have automatic aperture, automatic shutter speed, this is commonly known as the program mode or the P mode. The camera is going to be making most of the decisions for us. If I were to select shutter speed, and leave the aperture in the automatic mode, now this is referred to as shutter priority mode, where we determine the shutter speed and the camera determines the aperture. If we were shooting, let's say for example, wide open, and we rotate the shutter speed to automatic A, now we're in aperture priority mode because we've determined the aperture and the camera will now determine the shutter speed. If we dial in both the aperture and the shutter speed, now we are in 
manual mode. And I will show you how these icons appear, confirming everything I just told you that this is how the modes work on Fuji cameras. There is no mode dial. It's a matter of setting it to red A or not in certain features. In the beginning, I, I do believe it's easier for beginners to learn to just have your ISO set because otherwise the camera is going to be making changes, but there is a time and place for automatic ISO. While we are here, I wanna point out some of these physical controls. Obviously we have our power switch to turn the camera on. And in the middle of the power switch is the shutter button. You're gonna be using this all the time. A halfway depression engages our camera's focusing modes. If we're using automatic focus, we can focus the camera with a halfway shutter depression and then pushing the shutter button down all the way takes the picture. You can hear a little sound that we're getting from the camera. So very important, power switch, shutter button, learn to feel where that halfway depression is so you can focus your camera without actually taking a picture. Just in the front of this, we have our main control wheel. It's a rotating wheel and dial in the front. We're gonna be using it quite a bit. And we also have an opposite thumb control wheel. So these are very important and I'll demonstrate that this button over here, the way it's set up by default, it should be your metering mode, which is how the camera measures light coming into the camera. And this wheel here is the exposure compensation dial. You see it has these numbers on here, one plus one plus two, minus one minus two. This is how we can make our image brighter or darker in the first three modes, P, S, or A. And, there, and there's also a little C here. If you'll see it right there, that is custom exposure compensation. And I'll be demonstrating how that works as well, but there's a little C there, just changes how the, how the function operates. Something that's a little hard to see is this lever right here. We have a lever with a button in front. If you don't know this, it's kind of confusing, but you have to be looking through the viewfinder for this to work. And this allows us to toggle through the different types of views that we can use on the viewfinder. So the X100 series is very interesting in that we can use an optical viewfinder, just like cameras of old, with a digital overlay, or we can use an electronic viewfinder. And this switch here allows us to toggle back and forth between each of those. We also have the ability to determine whether or not how, how this button works, if we wanna use it for white balance or another setting, we can set that up and I'll demonstrate it in a second. I'm just pointing out these physical controls. We also have a hot shoe mount for a flash. On the left side of the camera, it's very easy to overlook this control, but I'm pointing it out now because we'll be referring to it later in, in the lesson. There's a switch that says M, C, and S. This is our focusing mode selector where M stands for manual, C stands for continuous, and S stands for single. So this is a single focus, which is used for still shooting subjects, you know, cooperating humans, landscapes, things of that nature. C, the continuous, is for sports shooting, moving subjects. And then M would be when we dial in the manual focus using this front ring on our lens. Something I want to point out real quick is that if you notice the optical viewfinder here, oh, it changed, very nice, um, is that if you toggle the viewfinder control switch in the front, in this type of a view, nothing's going to happen. The way this works is that there is an optical trigger here. And this is really designed that when you move the camera too close to our face, this little sensor will recognize it and it'll go into the optical or electronic viewfinder mode. So the idea here is that you have to be using the optical viewfinder to trigger and control whether it's electronic or optical. So we know this is optical because we can see through to the other side. And when we flip it back over, there's a little monitor that flips up. And so we're looking at a little TV monitor in there when we cannot look through to the other side. And there you can control the overlays. It's a really cool, beautiful feature. It's, I really like it, I think it's amazing. Let's talk about some of these other controls. There's a little switch here that has a little white mark next to it. That is the diopter adjustment. It is going to control how the focus works looking through this viewfinder. We have the drive button as well as the delete. So if we're playing back an image, this is going to allow us to delete it. We have auto focus lock, auto exposure lock button. 
We can program these and we can program some of these buttons in different ways, which I'll be demonstrating later. Of course, we have our joystick, very useful, very handy. It's not super robust, so I wouldn't recommend pushing too hard on it. Typically, this is going to be used to navigate the menus, change our focusing square if we don't want to touch on the viewfinder like this. We have our deep menu button, we have our play button, we have our display and back button. There's a very slight tension control grip right here. And next to that, you're going to see this little button that says Q. The Q button is a quick menu. And so when we push that, we can pull up a customizable quick menu that will allow us to access some of our more often used menu items without going into the deep menu. And again, there's a way to customize this. We also have on the side of the camera, some ports. So underneath this little cover, we have three ports. We have our microphone jack, which if you are recording for video, definitely recommend a microphone. I have a microphone that I make called the Maven Mini Mic. It's the best microphone in its class, in my opinion, and you can get that on my website as well as Amazon. We also have the USB terminal as well as an HDMI port, which would allow us to feed images to an external recorder, play it on our monitor, things of that nature. Obviously on the bottom, uh, you've probably already put your battery and your memory card in. So there are a couple other controls I want to demonstrate. You'll notice that the monitor's fading as I'm teaching, and this is a battery saving feature. But I also want to make sure that we have certain menu items turned on. So we're gonna jump into the deep menu. I know it's kind of early, it's a very intimidating menu, but there are two things that I want, I want to demonstrate, and they're on the second pages of each. So I am on the ranch icon, there's a little blue dot, screen setup. We're gonna come into the second page and we are looking for this preview, which is really exposure and white balance preview. We wanna make sure that this is turned on because when we go into the exposure lesson, if this is not turned on, it's not going to make any sense at all. The second icon that I want you to make sure is turned on is when we come into our button and dial settings, we have the ability to customize so many of our controls. And you can see it in this function FN setting where here we have the function one button. So we can come in here and customize this top button if we don't want to have it for our metering modes. And you, as I toggle through these, we get this little green icon designating what the control is and what it changes. So if I was to push to the right, I can customize to the histogram. Now in the deep menu, the TFN functions stands for touch function, which means there's four other controls built into the menu, but if you do not have this turned on, you are not going to see it. So it's this feature right here, touch function. If this is not turned on to on, you can swipe all you want and you're not going to see these. So once that's turned on, I'm gonna demonstrate how this works. So the idea on this is that if we want to access our white balance, I'm touching and swiping to the, to the right. Touching and swiping to the left will bring up our film simulations. Touching and swiping up will bring up our histograms. We can turn it off going in the same direction. Touching and swiping down brings up our level. And we're looking for this green indicator that tells us that it's even. So we have these really cool touch features that allow us to use the touch monitor as four additional controls. And we'll just go ahead and mention it, you know, again, real quick. In the beginning, kind of keep it the way it's set up. But as you become more and more familiar with the camera, you're going to want to customize it in certain ways. And that's where you would come in here and you would say, well, I don't really want this for the metering modes. Let's come in here and pick maybe face detection on and off, which is something that if you shoot portraits, you're going to use it all the time. So I'm going to leave that up to you once you get a good hang of the camera. Something else that you've been noticing is the camera is, is dropping off into this power mode, but the white balance is a little off. Let me, let me just flip this over to auto white balance for now, make it a little bit more neutral. We'll talk about all that in just a second. So let's take a look at our timers real quick. So right now we have this auto power turn off after two minutes. I don't want that because I'm teaching. So we're gonna leave that on for a while. Just wanna point this out if you're having a hard time seeing these numbers on the back. If you come into the wrench icon with a little blue square, and you come into screen setup and you go down to page three, we are going to have the ability to add large indicators. I'm going to leave it turned off for now because we lose some of the icons I wanna point out. 
But if you, you know, wear glasses like I do, and you want to see them a little bit easier, then you would use this on to the back LCD monitor. And the same is true for the EVF, OVF. We can make those large as well. A very cool side note on this is that we can actually control which indicators are appearing based on this left or right format. So we have the icons on the left, we have these icons on the right, and we can determine which icon is being displayed. To customize Fuji cameras is, is a dream because there's so many different ways to do it. Something I need to point out is that you will need to press the display button to toggle different sets of information to appear or disappear. And this is gonna be a little bit different depending on whether we're in a stills mode or whether or not we're in video mode. Sometimes you want more icons, sometimes you want less. Right now we have the, the large icon, so it's very easy to see these numbers on the bottom. And you will usually see corresponding numbers in your viewfinder. And the three numbers on the bottom that you are always going to keep an eye out for are your shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO. You always will kind of want to keep an eye on those three things. I'm going to change this back to regular icon size because I need to demonstrate some of these other icons. So now we go back to small icon mode. In the bottom left-hand corner, we have our modes. And I want to demonstrate how this changes as I rotate shutter speed to A. Now, because I've told the camera to determine the shutter speed and I've already dialed in the aperture, now we're in aperture priority mode. And if I rotate my lens all the way over to automatic, now we're in the program mode. And if I rotate the shutter speed control wheel over and, and pick a shutter speed, now we're in shutter priority mode. And if I rotate the aperture back to a fixed setting, now we're in the manual mode. So that is how we determine the modes. And it's a little bright. Turn this down. We'll talk about that in a minute. What are these other icons we're talking about? Okay, at the top right-hand corner, the big number that you see is going to be the number of shots remaining on our memory card. L is the large size. So I'm using the full 26 megapixels. And the F is the compression. How much image compression are we having when we're creating JPEGs? You'll notice that on, just to the right of that, we have this little finger kind of pointing up. This is our touch screen. When it's turned off, what this means is that when we touch the screen, we're not changing our focusing points. When we touch this, now it says shot, which means as, as I touch on the monitor, the monitor will focus and take the picture. Very annoying, I don't recommend it. We'll be talking more about using the touch monitor in the focusing lesson. DR at 100 stands for dynamic range setting. I would recommend leaving it here for now. We have our performance boost indicator. This feature will drain your battery a little bit faster, but it's basically putting the camera into hyper state mode where it's, it's operating at its highest performance. Here is our battery life indicator. Over here, we have the no flash icon, which means we don't have any flash on at the moment. And we also have this grid over here, which is our exposure compensation bar. Very useful, very powerful tool. We'll be talking about that when we get into the exposure lesson. So as I press the display button, I can make those things disappear and I can just use my focusing square if we want to get rid of it. And as I continue to press it, now we get our Q menu. We can see the settings in the Q menu real quick, to all kinds of information, the amount of video recording we have left, you know, the resolution for video recording. We have a histogram, we have our exposure compensation indicator, and now we're back to the original screen. So let's talk about the drive modes real quick. The drives determine what the camera does after we push a shutter button down all the way. And to access our drive modes, we're going to push the drive and delete button. This is going to pull up a sub menu that allows us to determine what, we, what we're telling the camera to do. And as we navigate through these controls, you can see it's giving us some prompts. So we have an electronic shutter burst that we're, is not set yet. And we'll talk about that when we get into the deep menu. We have CH, which is continuous high speed burst, and we can determine whether this is 11 or eight frames per second. We have continuous low, which can be six, five, four, or three frames per second. If you don't wanna shoot so many frames. The continuous drive means that when we push and hold the shutter button down, the camera will continue to take images. Really good 
when you are dealing with moving subjects, maybe kids running around, for example. We have our ISO bracket, which tells the camera that we want it to bracket the ISO between shots. We have white balance bracketing, which does the same for white balance, changes the color and the appearance of our images. The bracket feature, we can determine whether it's auto exposure, we can change that, whether it's film simulation bracketing, dynamic range bracketing, not something I recommend, and focus bracketing as well. So we can instruct the camera to change our focus between shots. As we come down, we have our HDR setting, high dynamic range. It's an automatic feature built into the camera that is really designed to get very bright details with dark shadows and try to get them kind of within the same image so you can see them. We have the panorama mode. So in the panorama mode, if you had a very wide scene, you would push and scroll the camera across the frame. And the idea is that you would get a nice panorama. Multiple exposure mode allows us to stack multiple images on top of each other. And then we have these advanced filters that I really don't use. I'm not really a huge fan of them. I think they're kind of gimmicky. The very bottom of this list, you notice that we got this blackout, is the video mode, so the movie recording mode. And I can see some banding in the monitor. That is normal when we are shooting under LED lights if your shutter speed is not set correctly. So I'm gonna visit this just real quick. You can see that I'm using a very fast shutter speed of 250th of a second. I've made a video on YouTube in terms of why this happens is because LED lights are flickering. And if your shutter speed is too fast, we begin to see this mismatch. So I'm shooting 30 frames per second. I wanna double that, 1 60th of a second. It's a little bright and I'm going to turn my ISO down just a little bit to adjust it. And lo and behold, that banding has disappeared because I'm using a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second. You could probably get away with slightly faster shutter speeds and not see it, but I wouldn't recommend fast shutter speeds when you're shooting video and LED lights for this reason. Another thing I wanna point out is now that we are in video mode, you will notice some of the icons have changed. For example, we have our audio levels, which tells us how loud the audio is coming into the camera. Right now we're using the camera's built-in microphones and this is telling us, hey, this is how loud it is. We can adjust and control this. At the very top, we have our video resolution, the amount of time left on our memory card. I have a small, smaller memory card in there right now. It's also telling us the resolution saved to the memory card as well as the resolution saved to the HDMI out. If you had an Atomos Ninja 5 recorder, you can send a signal out to that recorder and record in ProRes, for example, on the recorder. It's a lot to go into. You're looking at an extra thousand dollars to do this, but the feature's there if you want it. So that is an overview of our information screen as well as our drives. So I'm gonna turn back to photo mode. There we go. And I wanna talk about white balance real quick. There's a short answer to this and there's a much longer answer. I'm gonna give you the short answer. So we're, we're swiping to the right. The short answer is in the beginning, stick with auto white balance. This means the camera is going to be making most of the color determinations for you when we create JPEGs. When we shoot raw, we have that color information and we can correct it in post if we need to. Not true with JPEGs as much. We can, we can tweak it a little bit. There's just not as much information. Same thing with video is you wanna make sure this is accurate for video. And what you'll notice is even in auto white balance, you'll be shooting and for whatever reason, the color will appear off. And the reason this is the case is because the color of light is different depending on the source. The human eye does an amazing job of adjusting to it. Camera sensors cannot adjust like the human eye can, and therefore we have to come in and determine and tell the camera what light we're shooting in. So the idea is auto white balance for pure beginners. If you, you know, you got a lot of stuff on your plate, you don't wanna worry about it. We have custom white balance. I'll show you how to set those up in just a second. Kelvin white balance allows us to determine the temperature of light we're shooting in. I'm pushed to the right to get into this menu. So I can turn this up or down and you can notice the colors changing. And this is really the heart of the matter when we're dealing with white balance is we're giving the camera instructions to change 
what it is doing to counteract the light we're shooting in. This is starting to get into the longer answer that I really don't want to, but this is a very low Kelvin temperature setting. It's gonna be easier to look at the icon. In this case, we have a daylight or a sun icon. So the idea is if you're shooting in the sun, you'd put it on the sun icon, shade under a cloud maybe, different kinds of fluorescent lights. Well, that's just perfect right there. Incandescent light and even underwater. So the idea is to match the icon to the light that you're shooting in. And I'm shooting these blinds and you can, you can see that they're basically pure white as I'm shooting right now. And then here, here come the different color shifts. So the custom white balance, essentially what we're doing here is we're telling the camera, this is white. Whatever it is we're shooting in is white. So it's giving us instructions to designate a new white balance is to use the shutter button. And it takes that information and applies it to that custom white balance setting. I'm gonna hit okay to set it. And you can see that again, we have this perfect white, beautiful blind color. So that's your custom white balance. And I'm swiping on the touch monitor to pull open the white balance settings. The Kelvin temperature can be tricky. Basically what we wanna do is dial in the Kelvin setting for the light that we're shooting in. 5600 is daylight. It's one of the more useful ones to know. So 5600K, if I was shooting outdoors, this would be pure white. And there's a lot that I can go into, but just for the sake of time, that is the important take home message about white balance. One more little side note that I want to point out is when we see this little triangle pointing to the right, we have this R0, B0. What that is referring to is the white balance shift. So the idea on this is that we can, using the joystick or even these little arrows, is that we can come in and determine the exact location of a color shift to our white balance. Only in very rare occasions will I use it. If I have a funky light bulb, for example, that's at like 4,900K and it's not, it has a slight color shift to it is when I will start messing with this. So if you're brand new, don't worry about this. It's, it's pretty much a higher end setting. So I'm gonna hit back and that is your white balance. Before we get into the exposure lesson, there's a couple things I wanna point out is that when we have a, a focusing mode turned on and we're rotating the, the lens wheel, the front lens wheel, we're zooming in, and so some people will think this is an optical zoom. It's not, this is a digital zoom, and our lens is fixed. So we're shooting with a fixed lens that we can't change. And so when you see that zoom in, it's a digital effect. It's the same as cropping the image out. That's the first thing I wanna point out. The second thing I wanna point out is that if we push the viewfinder switch in the front of the camera in a photo mode, that we're using the back monitor, we can pull up a list of menu items that we can determine what the default button will be. So if we didn't like the swipe feature to get to white balance, and I set this to white balance, and I just press the button, now I have a quick white balance button. So that's the second thing I kind of wanted to point out. You'll notice that I am in the P mode, and I'm going to leave it on these smaller icons because we have this mode indicator, and it's gonna make more sense as I teach this. But now we're going to start talking about the fancy word exposure, which is just really a clever way of saying brightness. So when we talk about exposure control, what we're really talking about is brightness control, how to make an image brighter or darker. Now there's a short answer to this, and there is a long answer to this. The short answer is that if you are in the P, S, or A modes, and you want to change your brightness, we are going to use this dial right here. It's the exposure compensation dial. So if we take a picture and we play it back and we're not happy with it and we think, hey, we wanna make that brighter, I am going to rotate the exposure compensation dial and you'll notice that the preview is showing us that it's getting brighter and brighter. And I can, all, I can go all the way up to plus three and I can also go in the negative direction and go down to negative three. So that's the short answer. If, if you want to make your images brighter or darker in the P, S, or A modes, use your exposure compensation wheel. Now there's a longer answer to this that I am about to give you. And I'm also going to make the recommendation that if you are a pure beginner, try to avoid the P mode. I don't really use S mode 
the two modes that I use more than anything are the aperture priority mode and the manual mode. So if our shutter speed is set to automatic, we can rotate our aperture control wheel. I'm going to rotate it down to F2. And now we're in aperture priority mode. This is where you should really, you know, basically dig your foxhole and learn because when you learn this, you'll use it for the rest of your career. Uh, when I shot weddings, aperture priority mode, and the reason is, is because we would go from in chapel, dark, to a lobby, to the outdoors in 15 seconds. And in aperture priority mode, we determine the aperture. You can see it highlighted in blue. This is what we can control. And the camera determines the shutter speed. So as part of this philosophy of use, and this is what you'd really be getting on you know, my crash courses, you know, digital photography crash courses is, is the philosophy of use is how to think about this, is what I want you to do is to take your hand and move it in front of the camera, just like this. And I want you to watch what happens to the shutter speed. I'm cupping and blocking a little bit. And the reason I'm having you do this in looking at the shutter speed is to prove to you that in aperture priority mode, the camera is constantly making adjustments to the shutter speed based on how bright it is. So if I use aperture priority for sports shooting. I'm shooting sports, bright sunny day. Well, here comes a cloud. Well, the camera is going to notice that it's dark, it's darker now. And it's going to use a longer shutter speed to let more light in. And this is the heart of the matter with aperture priority mode, is that when you are short on time and you don't want to worry about, you know, changing your shutter speed every second, let the camera do it. Now, on the other hand, if I am shooting in a studio, I will dial in the exact shutter speed I want. And now I'm in manual mode. So that's how I differentiate if I have time, strobe, and I want more control, I'm shooting in manual. Pretty much all other times I'm shooting aperture priority mode. Now there are some things I want to demonstrate and I hope you can see it over here on the far left, is that we have this fancy bar and at the very top, it's kind of hard to see unless you're using the big icons, there's a little square with a diagonal through it that has a plus minus sign in it. This is our exposure compensation indicator. As we rotate the exposure compensation wheel to become brighter, you will notice that this tick mark is slowly going up in one third increments. So now that I'm at plus one, the image is brighter. A question you should be asking yourself is how did the camera pull this off? Now, the only way we can make this really make any sense is that we have to turn our auto ISO off. And right now I'm on. Auto ISO, the camera's making decisions, and I'm just gonna turn this to 400 and see what happens. So now that our ISO is set to a fixed number, what I want you to do is to look right here. One 160th of a second for an even exposure. So when this little tick mark is at zero, we're telling the camera we want an even exposure. So let's watch what happens to the tick mark and the shutter speed as we go up to one gotten a little brighter there. So now we're at 1 80th of a second. When we do the math, 1 80th of a second is twice as long as 1 160th of a second. So that's like taking 1 160th of a second plus 1 160th of a second gives us 2 160th of a second which if we round it down is, you guessed it, 1 80th of a second. So that's what's happening. It's a little deeper side to it is that as we are changing the exposure compensation, we're giving the camera instructions to shift the shutter speed based on the desired brightness level. And that works in both directions. If we were to continue to go up for one more stop, you can do the math. 1 80th plus 1 80th is 2 80ths. 280th rounded down is 140th. So it should be 140th when we get to that third tick mark. And there it is. If we were to continue, it'd be 120th of a second. And it also works in the other direction. So here we are at an even exposure. And if we wanted a negative one stop, it would be twice as long. 
and there oh, it's in the ballpark it's kind of metering a little bit should be one 320th of a second but it's a little bit darker for some reason but in any event that is the philosophy of use with exposure compensation when we change the style now something else you're going to notice that on this on this dial on the opposite side we have this letter c c stands for custom and when we have that custom indicator turned on, you're going to notice that the bar grew. We get all these other extra numbers in here, right? And the way this works is that when we are in C mode, we can rotate the front dial and change our exposure compensation directly. So in summary, for aperture priority mode, we determine the aperture by rotating our aperture control wheel and the camera makes the adjustment to the shutter speed. Two quick side notes is that when you are shooting in aperture priority mode, it is very critical to always sneak a peek at your shutter speed. If you are holding the camera with your hands with no tripod and you're shooting a still moving person, for example, you're gonna want a, a minimum shutter speed of 1 60th of a second or faster, maybe 1 100th, maybe 1 200th. Why? Because you move and people move and the most common mistake that beginners make when they're first learning is they're shooting in low light and they're wondering why their pictures are blurry. It's because the camera's using a longer shutter speed. And when you have a longer shutter speed and you're moving the camera, now things become blurry. So if you're shooting people, probably a good idea to start off at about one one hundredth of a second, you know, for portraits. If you're shooting a moving athlete, it's probably gonna be one five hundredth of a second or faster. So those are two quick recommendations. Let me demonstrate how this is different in the shutter priority mode. So we're gonna dial in the shutter speed and I'm gonna rotate the aperture ring to red A. And so now we have a shutter speed. Let's go with something a little bit faster to show you this problem that we'll have. Now the camera is saying aperture is red. What does the camera mean when we see that? This, this red aperture moves zoom out. Basically what's happening is the camera is saying it cannot open the aperture wide enough to accommodate our shutter speed. It's basically saying if we take a picture, it's gonna be too dark and we can prove this. Let's take a picture, play it back, and you can see it's underexposed. So in this instance, let's say you were shooting, um, you know, your kid running around, he's really fast. We want that fast shutter speed. The aperture is open as wide as it will go. How can we resolve this? Think about it for just a second. If you said bump up your ISO, you're absolutely correct. So what we're going to do is bump up the ISO. And as we turn it up, eventually that red goes away and the camera is saying, okay, now we have enough to, to get an evenly exposed image when we bump the ISO. Now ISO does have a trade-off is that as you increase your ISO, it's going to make your image more and more grainy. The more you boost that, that's just the trade-off. So you want to kind of try to have your ISO as low as possible. Fuji cameras are typically pretty good, even up to you know ISO 1600, sometimes 3200, depends on what you're shooting. I like to shoot at 400 or lower whenever possible, but it just depends. You know, if, if you have no other options, you got to do it. So in shutter priority mode, we determine the shutter speed. Here it is, I'm changing it. And you can see that the camera is changing the aperture as I'm rotating the shutter speed wheel. So the camera, if I cover the lens, it's trying to open the aperture up. And that's the heart of the matter with shutter priority. It's a mode I actually never use, almost never, is we dial in the shutter speed, the camera takes care of the aperture. So now what I'm gonna do is put it into program mode. Now what you'll notice is we don't have any blue indicators which means the camera is going to be de determining most of these. But we also get this control wheel in the back. And what this means is that when we rotate this, the camera is going to give us different combinations of both shutter speed and aperture. So if you know you wanted a faster shutter speed, you could change it by sneaking a peek and just looking and let letting the camera determine everything else. Program mode is the mode that I use when I am shooting with a strobe at an event. It's typically the handheld mode for most cameras, the handheld flash mode for most cameras, where basically we're saying we have a flash and we want to have a, a, you know, a good shutter speed and a good aperture. We don't want to overexpose it. And that is the, pretty much the only time I use program mode. So the last mode obviously is manual mode. So if we select shutter speed and I rotate my 
aperture control wheel to 2.0, you can see that both of these are highlighted in blue, which means we have full control over both of them. In manual mode, we just determine the shutter speed, we determine the aperture, and the camera obeys. It doesn't do anything for us. In manual mode is, I believe, actually the easiest one to learn. You just dial in the settings, right? So this brings up the question about auto ISO. Auto ISO, to get to it, we're gonna lift up the ring and I'm gonna rotate it until it says A in the little window. There is a time and place for it. Most of the time, I don't use it. You can see right here, we have the auto ISO indicator. The idea on auto ISO is that basically the camera will make adjustments to the ISO when you have a locked in shutter speed and aperture when the lighting conditions change. So something I wanna point out is that when we're in auto ISO, we can determine the limits, how far the camera can go. When we start getting into 3200 and 6400 and 12,800, it starts to get really, really grainy. So when we, we dive into the menu, I'll point this out, but here's the auto ISO setting. And we have three different settings for it. And each of these have a different minimum and maximum. So if I were to come in and, and choose a higher maximum, just for the sake of demonstration, I wouldn't recommend using this. So at this point, when we have this maximum ISO here, and we rotate the exposure compensation wheel in manual mode, we're giving the camera permission to use the ISO to shift the exposure. So I know that's a lot of information, but that is brightness or exposure control. Those are the different modes. This is how they work. We talked about the philosophy of use. The camera is constantly measuring light. We talked about different shutter speeds and, and how to make it brighter or darker. It's a lot of information, but it's one of the most important ones that you will, you will have as a photographer. So make sure that you watch that section a couple times until it becomes second nature. The exercise I would recommend, put your camera in aperture priority mode. So that we have a red A for the shutter speed, wide open for the aperture. I'm going to, I'm not a huge fan of auto ISO in the beginning, so we'll just dial it into 400, take a picture of anything, and then take another one brighter, and then take another one darker. That's the exercise. If you just learn that one skill set, you're going to be off to a great start. Let's talk about our camera's focusing modes. And the way I like to teach this is the how, the when, and the where. How, when, and where. If you can think of focusing in these terms, it's going to be far easier than trying to remember all the modes and things of that nature. So the question is, is how do we focus? Well, we've already talked about it. We push a shutter button down halfway. And we get these indicators with this green circle here, the bottom left-hand corner. We also get a green outline on the box. I put a target up there. I'm focusing. Push the shutter button down all the way. It takes the picture. Pretty straightforward. Now, many people, especially sports shooters, they like to do something called back button focusing. And so we could move the focusing mechanism to our auto exposure lock button, but I'm not going to get into that right now. So when we're talking about the win we are talking about the camera's focusing modes, and that's the switch on the side of the camera. It is currently pointed to S, and we can see it here on the monitor, auto focus single. So what auto focus single means is that when we push the shutter button halfway down, it engages the camera's focusing systems, and it stops. Once it gets focusing lock, as long as we hold that halfway shutter button depression down, the focus position is not going to change, which means we can get focus lock, we can recompose, and that's something that you're going to want to learn to practice to do, is you got a still subject, but you want to frame it a little bit different, and you do that by holding the shutter button halfway down and reframing. That's called recomposing. It's going to work better when we have slightly stopped down apertures, f4, f5, maybe five or 5.6, when we have very wide apertures and we try to do this, sometimes we'll pull the focal plane out of position and it'll be blurry. So something to keep in mind. So what does the C stand for? I'm going to move the switch to auto focus C. There's the indicator. Auto focus C stands for continuous. And so when we push the shutter button halfway down, you're going to notice that we get these parentheses. We don't get that with the original. We just get a dot. When you see the dot with the parentheses, what that means is the camera is focusing over and over and over again. There is no focusing lock as we had 
an autofocus single. And for this reason, autofocus continuous is ideal for moving subjects. And that is the key difference between the two. Autofocus single is for still subjects. Autofocus continuous is for moving subjects. And we can't really recompose on this because as we do so, the camera is focusing over and over again and focus position is changing. So the last designator here is M, which stands for manual focus. Now, when we are in manual focus, you're going to see this rangefinder indicator on the bottom of the screen. And there's a little tick mark that is showing us where we are focusing. So as we rotate the focusing ring in manual focus mode, we don't have that digital zoom, it becomes true manual focus, and we can change the position of our focal plane using that indicator. Now we can also look at the monitor, but there's even a better tool, is that when I go over the square, if I take this back control wheel and push it into the camera, I get a zoom feature, and there it is. So I can push in and I can rotate it in either direction. And it'll punch in even more. I can rotate that wheel until it gets tack sharp. And I know that it's tack sharp because we're zoomed in, tap the shutter button, and the focus will not change. And that technique is referred to as zoom manual focus. It's very handy for shooting video or any kind of situation where you want to lock your focus down. So that is the win the camera is focusing, whether it's once, many times over, or in manual focus only. Now there's a couple other tools I'm gonna to come back to and show you like peaking, for example. But before we get into that, I wanna talk about the where the camera is focusing. And this deals with the camera's focusing square. We see it as a white box right now on the monitor, kind of hard to see. Maybe I'll turn the shutter speed down a little bit so we can see that focusing square a little bit better as, a, as I'm moving it around. So the focusing cluster, the reason why this is awesome is because we can touch on the monitor. Oh, it's turned off. See that, see this little finger guys turned off. We want it to say, it keeps, it does. I think there's a little bug here because when I'm touching this, it's opening up my, my white balance. There it is. Touch autofocus. See, so this is, this is probably a, a slight glitch with the camera or a reason not to use those touch, uh, touch motion features. But when I touch onto the screen, the camera is getting autofocus. And I can push the shutter button down and take the picture. One of the problems that it has is it has this autofocus green mode that's on. We just want to get it here, right? Maybe touch somewhere else. And so this is kind of becoming a bit of a problem. This is a bug. Um, Fuji needs to address this. So what I'm going to do for now is I'm going to turn that off because it's driving me crazy as I'm trying to teach. So let's come into the touch setting for those guys. And I'm going to turn those off for now. Otherwise, I'll lose my mind. So the, the one that we're looking for is touch area. And what this is going to allow us to do is to touch on the monitor and determine the focus square that we're using. It's very fast, it's very easy. Now, when we're looking through the viewfinder, it's not quite as easy, and so sometimes people prefer to use the joystick, but there is a touch feature that we can use the touchpad as we are looking through the viewfinder to change our focusing square, and that is found in the same area we just were, so in screen setup. So if we come to the second page of button and dial setting, touch screen setting. And if you come down to this one, EVF, OVF, touch screen area setting, this allows us to determine what part of this back monitor is touch sensitive to change our focusing squares. Right now it's the whole monitor. If you are right eyed dominant, it'll probably be easier just to use that. If you're left eyed dominant and your nose is over here, you may wanna choose a smaller area, for example, maybe something like that. So you would change the focusing squares in the blue region. Just a side note, just in case you're, you're interested in that kind of a thing. But yeah, I use the touch monitor all the time, especially for video recording, just touch on it and point. There are some other features in here that are pretty cool. For example, if we want to change the size of our focusing square, I can push the joystick into the camera and we get these focusing points 
and we can rotate the back control wheel to determine the size, whether it's a very, very small pinpoint focus or something larger. So it's a very powerful tool that you should be aware of in terms of how to change your focusing square size as well as the location. If we push the joystick into the camera body, it should reset back to center. So in that short overview, we've talked about the how, the when, and the where the camera is focusing. And I wanna start getting into some of the other custom tools for focusing, because there's a lot of options and they're very powerful. When we come into the deep menu and press the deep menu button, you're going to notice this AFMF, which is all, this whole tab is for different kinds of focusing and there's a couple other features as well. But when we come up to focusing area, this is the same quick menu that we saw when we're shooting and we just push the joystick into the camera. When we're not pushing the joystick into the camera, when we push just the control wheel into the camera, we get the zoom feature and that's how you differentiate between the two. When we come down to this auto focus mode, this allows us to choose different types of clusters. So we have the one basic square, but we also have the ability to use a zone. So if we come into the zone, you can see that we have this little plus minus sign. And so we can change the size of the zone in the same way we did the smaller square. The zone allows us to select a larger area. It's going to be better for faster moving subjects you know, when you don't want a teeny focusing square trying to get it on there. Open up the cluster size and it's going to make it easier. And then we can also go to wide as well as tracking. And this is using a much larger part of the viewfinder. The camera is looking for areas of contrast to focus on. When we come into the menu in our auto focusing mode is set to all, what this will allow us to do is to toggle through all of these using this back monitor. And you, you saw real quick, we got this, uh, you know, there was an indicator there. There it is, the zone. It's telling us how big our clusters are. So we can control the size of these squares. And there's a really great feature that you should be aware of when you're in the zone or we're just leave it on a wide feature. Tap the shutter button. Is right now it's looking for contrast. But when I come in here and we're going to select eye and face detection. We have the ability to choose face detection or eye detection. And when you are using a very wide aperture like F2 in a blurry background, this is definitely the way to go because we don't need to recompose. So now that we're on face detection, the camera recognizes this beautiful model's face and it's doing the focusing work for us. We push the shutter button halfway down, it engages focusing, so when you are shooting portraits, eye detection is the way to go in those modes. And, and there are different ways we can set it up with custom buttons. I kind of like the customizable button up here to turn it to be my eye and face detection. Just It's just really preference depending on what you want. So I can come in and toggle that and get into to the eye detection. And it's something that you need to be aware of because it's such a powerful tool. We can even select whether it's the left eye or the right eye. So keep that in mind, face detection, eye detection, very powerful. Now there is another feature called autofocus plus manual focus is that when you turn this on, we have the ability that once we get a focusing lock and we're holding that shutter button halfway down, when we rotate the focusing ring, we jump into a manual focus, it's there if you need it. We have different kinds of manual focus assists. So if we come down here, the triangle to the right means we have some other tools. Right now it's on standard. If I come down and go to focus peaking, I'll demonstrate this real quick. We'll go high and it doesn't really like it unless we're in manual mode of some kind, but there it is, it's this red overlay. And that red overlay is identifying areas of high contrast, which basically suggests the camera will be in focus in those areas. It's really good for manual focus. It's really good when shooting video, but that is the peaking tool. And there are these other tools I'm not gonna go into, the digital split image, the microprism, uh, different ways to focus it as well. Something that I wanna point out is that when we come into the video mode, some of those focusing options have changed a little bit. Now the video mode is great for using touch focus, especially when we're using AFC, but the question that 
I know many of you will have is what about face detection when you come into your menu and you and you go to the you know the face detection area and it's like where is it what what happened to all those settings look it's turned off so it's very important to note that there's a difference between the auto focus manual focus for stills versus video so it's it's the similar name nomenclature it's all the same but it's in the video mode when we're talking about focusing and here it is so if you're doing vlogging but it's the same setting we can turn it on for auto detection for an eye and now we get this box over the eye for video so just keep that in mind is that the camera views focusing for stills differently than it does for video when we come in and we look at some of these focusing tools that we have for example let's see if we can find one the autofocus area, we're only given two options in terms of these zones. And I almost always go with area because it allows us to, you know, choose the, the precision in the place of it. But this is what it looks like with face detection, very powerful tool. When you're vlogging or you want it to track a moving face, we have the peaking focus, just like we did in stills. There it is. You can choose the different colors. Focus check basically means that when we rotate the manual focus ring, in manual focus, it punches in, it zooms. But we're gonna start getting into some of this deep menu stuff here in just a second and uh, cover the most important things that you need to know. But you'll notice that we get this great outlook when we are in the video mode because the camera doesn't do stills. Turn that on, come back in, and most of those features are gonna reappear. So whenever you see something grayed out, it's typically because we're in a mode the camera doesn't see as compatible with that feature. Before we get into the deep menu, there's something else I, I want to point out. And it's this Q button right here. You know, sometimes we don't want to go into the deep menu. We just want access to some of these features. And these are all customizable. As you scroll over, it's going to tell you what each of these settings do. So we can select something like auto white balance and then rotate the wheel. You know, and, and it's a far faster way than getting into the deep menu system. Uh, you know, we have our timer. If you wanted to do a time shot, here's, here's face detection. So so definitely something you should be aware of. Two 10 second timer, very quick, fast, easy way to do it. Photometry, uh, face detection, for, for whatever reason, it pre prevents us from looking at the exposure mode. And so when you see this yellow icon, it's basically what it's saying. So we, we would need to come in and turn off our face detection. Come up and let's find face detection. Let's turn this off. Once we turn that off, we have the ability to activate our metering modes. And, and if you're curious in what terms of what this is, essentially we're telling the camera to look in different areas and determine how much light is needed. So the easiest way for me to demonstrate this is with the spot metering mode. And I'm in, in program mode. But basically the spot metering mode, and here's a little light, right? So when I move the light over the focusing square, what's happening is light is being measured within this focusing square. We could even make it smaller. In the spot metering mode, that's what's going on at least. And so what you'll notice is that the shutter speed doesn't really change when the light is outside the box, but when I move it over the box, the camera recognizes it one four thousandth of a second. So spot metering mode ties the camera's ability to measure light to the focusing mode. And in these other modes, these are just variations of it where we have a multi-metering mode looking at the entire frame. It's actually broken up into different zones and they have different percentages. We have more of a center weighted and more of an average, but the two that I recommend in the very beginning are multi-metering and the spot metering modes. Let's take a look at the deep menu system. And there is a ton of information in here. And for the sake of time, I'm gonna to try to go through the most important menu items in here. And there's no way I could cover it all. Even when I do it on you know, full crash courses for cameras, it takes, in some cases, two hours to go through everything. So something you should notice is the navigation. The one thing I wish is that this was touch screen sensitive. It's not for the deep menu. And because of this, we have to navigate using, using the joystick. So we get a highlight indicator telling us whether we're in the side column or the main column. And we get a white indicator at our current location. You'll also notice we have a color code and we have these little tick marks for each pages within, it, within a tab. 
which is also de designated here. So one out of three pages. And as I highlight and scroll down, that indicator shifts to the second. So two out of three and so on and so forth. So the tabs for the beginning is image quality, IQ, autofocus, manual focus settings, still shooting settings for photography. We have our flash settings. We have our video settings and we have our camera setup. We also at the very bottom have a My Menu tab, which allows us to use and save, customize different types of, of the things that we select the most. But in the beginning, let's just jump through image quality real quick. We've talked about a lot of these things already. This is just a different way to select it. Image size, oh, and by the way, anytime you see a triangle, this gives us an option to you know, choose, choose more selections. So aspect ratio, is three by two for the sensor. That's the, the dimensions of it. In most cases, you should leave it here, but if you wanted to shoot at 16 by nine aspect ratio or another aspect ratio, you could do so, and it would change the number of shots remaining based on the file size. Image quality, this deals with JPEG or RAW. So if you wanted all of the color information, you would choose a RAW either by itself or with a JPEG. So you can shoot both RAW and JPEG together. JPEGs are a lot smaller. For raw recording, we can go with something called lossless compressed, which is a much smaller file size, so it saves space without losing some of the data that we want when we're using raw. The film simulations Fuji's known for, and we can access it, I demonstrated in one of the swipe tools. Essentially, it gives it these different looks. So if you were to use different kinds of films in a film camera, Fuji is beloved for this feature alone. It's the only company that does it, in my opinion, on a high level. And for video modes, some of these, like the Eterna mode is, is pretty awesome. Okay. For shooting movies and things of that nature. It's a preference thing in taste, so that's what it's all about, film simulations. We have a monochromatic uh, adjustment feature for black and white. We can add grain, add chrome effects, kind of skimming through this. White balance we covered. This is the deep menu position that we can select it from. Our dynamic range. We have our dynamic range priority when you're shooting with different settings in here, such as auto. Uh, just leave it on DR100 for now. I think it's going to give you your best bang for your buck when you're started. We can adjust our tone curve, color, sharpness, noise reduction. Clarity, all of these apply to JPEG. And essentially what we're doing is we're giving the camera different sets of instructions in terms of how to create those JPEGs. Long exposure noise reduction is something I recommend leaving on simply because it is going to clean up these longer exposures when we have these random variations of shot noise. It's a lot to get into. Color space sRGB, unless you're shooting for a magazine that requires Adobe RGB. Pixel mapping, if you get a dead pixel, we can reset the sensor, and this is where you would come in and do it. It's asking, do you want to do it? I'm going to say no. Custom settings deal with basically memorizing all of these different variations to different customizable uh, indicators, C1, C2, C3. We can access those using the Q menu, so you have these different numbers that we can add these different customizations to, and you'll notice that we have the film simulations changing. So the idea on this is that we can customize these by coming in, you choose which number you want, and if you continue to come over, you'll have the ability to edit. And so we can edit all these settings. It looks the same as you know, the menu, but we can basically tell the camera, hey, memorize this custom setting. So when I come into my Q menu and I select it, all those features will be dialed in. You can see there's a lot of them. So. You know, the other ones are, are kind of grayed out, but for the image quality, we have that ability to designate it in advance. Very powerful if you are into customizations. We're going to go ahead and cancel this for now. We'll go back, back. And that is the first image quality tab. Now, the second tab, autofocus, manual focus, we've talked about quite a few of these already. When we're dealing with the focusing area, those are the clusters that we can change. It's faster to do it from the back of the camera, in my opinion back in. We have our focusing. So the area size, we have the clusters. We can come in and customize shooting for autofocus continuous. We see this on other Fuji cameras that we can adjust how the camera is focusing. It's a lot to go into. I would just say leave it on multi-purpose for now if you're just getting started. 
When we're talking about the focusing mode in the point displays, essentially the idea is that when we are shooting in landscape versus portrait mode, we can instruct the camera to, to remember the focusing cluster we used and the position of that cluster in those orientations. So if you were to turn them on, the number of focusing points, I think 117 is fine, but if you go to 425, let's just demonstrate it real quick, push the joystick in, we get a lot more, see a lot more focusing squares to choose from. So when we're scrolling you know, across, we go individually. I really believe 117 is plenty. It's, it's faster to scroll across the screen, for example. Pre-auto focus is something I leave turned off. If you turn it on, the camera is constantly going to be focusing wherever that focus square is, and it can drain your battery. It also slows it down a little bit, so it stays off on my camera. Autofocus illuminator, if you come to the front of the camera, you'll notice there's a little light just above the viewfinder switch, and that light will turn on in very dark situations if you have it turned on. Face and eye detection we've talked about. We've talked about autofocus, manual focus. Manual focus assist deals with peaking, for example, and some of these other split image and micro prisms. I just don't have enough time to go into great detail on this. Focus check is a zoom on the monitor when we're using our manual focus ring in manual mode. We can interlock our focusing area and our spot exposure area together. This is typically a pretty good idea if you're using spot metering. I'm just gonna scroll down here. A lot of these on the release and focus, typically for a single, it, it's a little bit better to keep it on focus. And this is what we're telling the camera to prioritize. Do you want it to be focused or do you want it to track and release the shot for maximum frames per second? Autofocus range limiter. When we get the display for autofocus, do we want to limit the range that it operates within? We can activate and manage our touch focusing options. So now we're getting into the shooting tab, first page. Sports finder mode is essentially an overlay that allows us to see how we're cropping in when using this mode. It's a little faint white outline here. Let me turn this down a little bit so you can see it. But you can see this wide outline here, basically shooting at 16 megapixels, and some people love it. The file sizes are going to be smaller. You can see this designated with the yellow M. Self-timer, obviously, it's a timer. And if you want to, I have this set up in my quick menu to find it easier, but it's 2 or 10 seconds. And you can save the self-timer setting. Interval timer shooting is the basically telling it's a timer. Uh, you tell the camera to take a picture every, in this case, one minute. How many times do you want that picture to be taken? You can go up to infinity or 999. This is really cool for landscape shooting, for sunsets, for example. I demonstrate this on some of my other courses, is that over a period of time, we take these pictures and we can take these images and, and put them together in a movie. It's pretty cool. Exposure smoothing has to do when the interval timer shooting function is on and you get slow, sudden changes in exposure. The idea is to smooth this and to make it a gradual transition. I usually shoot in aperture priority mode when I'm doing these kinds of things for the same reason, because the shutter speed's going to be changing at certain points, and this allows it to be uh, smooth even more. The auto exposure bracket setting allows us to determine how many frames and by how many exposures. So in this case, it would be three frames, and we can change our step intervals by scrolling up or down. Let's go three stop intervals. And we can also basically shift that over using the exposure compensation wheel. It's typically how it works. The idea with, the, with bracketing is that we're telling the camera to change certain settings between each shot, and that's what bracketing is all about. One frame or continuous. So this is asking if we want to take this one image at a time, meaning that we push the shutter button down each time, Continuous is we push it once and the camera takes all three of the images. And then the sequence setting is the order in terms of even exposure, brighter exposure, underexposure, or if you wanted to have a different order, you could come in and change it. It doesn't really matter because when you pull it into your Lightroom or Photoshop, you can see it in Bridge and you can usually see which ones are brighter or not. So this is preference. Film simulation bracketing. So when we choose a certain film simulation, 
we have the ability to bracket between these three film simulations if we choose the film simulation bracket. There it is. Again, how many frames, how many intervals, the steps, things of that nature. It's basically for bracketing the film simulations. Multiple exposure is stacking two images on top of each other. The, the best case examples I see of this is a portrait with a, a bright background. So you got a person. And then the second shot is overlaid on vegetation. And there's some really crazy, amazing things that people have done with this. Check it out online. It's something you can do in Photoshop. So it's kind of one of these things, you know, doing it in camera. It's not really, you, you know, you can, there are other ways to do it is what I'm saying. Uh, photometry or the metering modes. Again, we've talked about this. This is how the camera is measuring light coming into the frame. Shutter types, mechanical shutter is the one that's going to have the fewest artifacts because when we go with an electronic shutter, we're not using this mechanical curtain that goes in front of the sensor. And when you're, you're moving or your subject's moving, you can get jello effects. If you're shooting in LED lights, you can get banding. There's even hybrids where we have a combination of mechanical with electronic. And in these cases, when, when we start involving electronic shutter, we can get very fast shutter speeds up to one thirty-two thousandth of a second. And this is probably going to, going to be the, the time that you would consider using this is if you had a need for a very fast shutter speed. So the combination setting here basically means is that up to one four thousandth of a second we are going to be using mechanical, and once we go over that, it'll be electronic. And there are some other limitations that we, when we go into electronic modes, certain features may not work, things of that nature. Flicker re reduction has to do with when we're shooting in flickering lights, like LEDs, sodium-based lamps, things of that nature. The camera is able to analyze in time to shoot between the flickers. It works better on some cameras than others. I remember at, at a sporting event, I saw it, the colors were changing between shots. And it was because of the lamps I was sh shooting in. And so I flipped it over to flicker reduction and then they became, you know, all the same. It's pretty interesting. Auto ISO setting, we talked about this already. So we have three different settings for auto ISO. And the idea on this is that it allows us to determine the range, the sensitivity range that that particular auto ISO will work within. So 160 to 800 is the range for auto one. It also allows us to designate a minimum shutter speed. So in certain sports shooting situations, this can be very handy if you never wanted to go under, let's say one, you know, 250th of a second, you would come in here and select this and the camera would then adjust between these ISOs trying to give you a minimum shutter speed of one 250th. The conversion lens feature, uh, a lot of people don't know this, is you can buy conversion lenses to shoot either more telephoto or more wide. And these are adaptive lenses that we put on the front of our camera. And we would have to come in here and, and set this to wide or telephoto, and that would correct the distortion or the perspective in those cases. The ND filter is pretty amazing. We have a built-in ND filter. If you come in here and you come to on, while you look at the front of your lens, you will see a very small ND filter flip in front of the lens. It's built into the camera. It's a really cool feature to see on a, such a small camera, but yes, we do have a built-in ND filter. This ND filter is four stops. So if you're trying to do very long exposures during the daytime, maybe flowing rivers or water, things of that nature, you would not need an additional ND filter. Very cool feature. This wireless communication is how we connect to the Fuji app. So essentially what we're doing here is we turn our camera into a Wi-Fi port itself, so we're not connecting to the home, we go into our smartphone's devices and we join this network. And if I have time, I'll, I'll kind of try to show you how it works. But this is where it's done. Really cool feature. And let's come back. In regards to flash settings, we have a very small built-in flash. It's just right in front of the camera. It's very small. This is not a high-end flash, and if you're going to do any serious flash work, I would recommend the Godox TT685F. It's like a Canon speed light. We would connect it here with our hot shoe mount. These flash settings, the way we see them now, are in regards to the built-in flash where we can tell it not to fire, and if we wanted to change some of these settings, TTL through the lens. 
There's also flash exposure compensation where we can control how bright or how dark the flash is becoming. It's a lot of information pretty much beyond the scope of this video. Suffice it to say that there's some very minor things that we can do with that flash, like fill flash, for example. If you have heavy backlight, it can really save you. Some of these features down here allow us to change through the sync modes, whether it's TTL, slow sync using longer exposures, or if we are using a front or rear shutter curtain. Red eye re removal features deal with firing either a pre-flash or using a software cleanup in, in regards where it's saying removal. So in this case, it would be the pre-flash. In this case, it would be the software cleanup. In this case, it would be both of them. It's the top one. I'm gonna skip through the rest of this. The built-in flash, we can turn it off if we wanted to. Just come in here and do that. Now we're getting into the video mode. There are a ton of things in here that are very similar to the stills mode. So we're not gonna spend time on those like film simulations. It's just applying it to video and we get that with the, and we can tell the difference because we get this movie camera icon. It's basically saying the film simulation for video. But there are a couple things in here that you should definitely be aware of. The first of which is the resolution is that as we scroll up and down through this list, we can see the different resolutions here on the bottom. 1920 by 1080 is standard high definition. It also gives us the amount of time we can record with that resolution. In 4K, we have both options. There's the 3840 or the even wider 4096. And we can come over and pick whether it's 30, 25, 24, 23 frames. And we can even increase the megabits per second. Now this deals with the quality of the video. Typically when you're recording with more megabits per second, you get, a, you get a higher quality. It's kind of a lot to go into, but suffice it to say, this is where we select our resolution. And most of the time I'm recording at 16 by nine, 3,840 pixels wide by 2,160 pixels tall. So I usually shoot at hundred megabits per second. And I'm also typically shooting at 30 frames per second. Now, because I am on a stills mode and we're changing the video settings, we can hear the camera shuffling through the menu to, to make these changes. Now, the full HD high-speed recording requires that we do this in standard high definition. So when we come in here and we select something like, let's do it at four times. So we're shooting at 120 frames per second. This is the important one. We hit OK. You'll notice that the 4K gets grayed out because we can't shoot in 4K with this higher frame rate. The idea of the higher frame rate is that when you shoot at faster frames per second and you play it back at regular speed, in this case, it would be four times slow motion. One of the incredible things about Fuji cameras is that they're able to do this and maintain face detection. It's one of the few camera systems that can do it. And for this reason, I always have a Fuji camera on hand because I do these slow motion hero shots where we need to track a face, face somebody walking in slow motion. Uh, beyond Fuji cameras, you're looking at very high-end uh, film video cameras to, to be able to do that. It's, it's an Easter egg of a feature. Really awesome. So then we come into the film simulations, white balance, dynamic range, tone curve, color. All of these are similar to what we did in the stills, only this is applying to video. Sharpness, noise reduction, interframe noise reduction. F-Log is the log profile for Fuji, and, and I don't really recommend using this unless you are doing some very high-end color grading. It's, it basically means there's going to be a lot of work at the end. If you're a beginner or an intermediate shooter and you're shooting you know, video and you're just learning the ropes, it's way beyond anything that you'll wanna get into, at least for now. If you become very advanced, you know, on a professional level and you want F-Log, then you're going to be recording in 10-bit 422 and trying to get, you know, the maximum information out of your files and things of that nature. So suffice it to say, this is beyond the scope of anything a beginner or intermediate uh, videographer would probably want to mess with at this time. Peripheral light correction is very important because it cleans up the vignetting in the corners. The focusing area, we've, we've talked about all this. It's basically your focusing square. The movie clusters, there's only two of them, and I use the area one more than the multi because I, it just seems to be more accurate. 
uh, easier to use. I almost never change this. So I'm changing my focusing squares in the area focusing cluster. We can customize how autofocus continuous works in video. We can make it more sensitive or we can make it faster using these two features. So there's tracking sensitivity. We can make it more quick or more locked on. And we can also change the speed to be faster or slower depending on how fast you want that focus to occur. Face detection for video shooting is really nice when you're doing vlogging or you're teaching in a classroom setting, maybe walking around. We have the focus assist tools we've already talked about. This would apply again to video so we could do peaking, for example. Focus check is again, just like photography. If you're in manual focusing mode and you rotate your focus ring, it'll punch in, it'll zoom in. HDMI output info display. So if we're running this to something like a Ninja 5 recorder and we want to display our shooting information, we would turn it on. If we were recording and wanted clean output, we would leave this turned off. These next couple features are in regards to what we are saving and where. So in this case, we can record 4K video onto our memory card and output 4K video to our HDMI cable. So when we're shooting and we want backup, and, and we only have one memory card, so if we want backup and we have a Ninja 5, we could record 4K video to both of them. But we may not want that. We may want 4K saved to the memory card and standard high def saved to the HDMI recorder, and that's what FHD, full high definition, or we can go full HD to the memory card, 4K to the HDMI, or maybe we just wanna record with the HDMI recorder, so the output. So this is where we would come in and set these up. The difference between this guy and this guy is that one of them will be recorded to 4K. In the case we only want full HD, then our option would be here. We even have the ability to determine when we're in standby mode. So when we're not actually recording, do we want it to be in 4K or full HD? HDMI recording control, so to begin, start and stop recording, we can do it from our HDMI device. The zebra setting, when we turn this on, it basically tells us what is overexposed by giving us this diagonal marching ant overlay. Uh, very popular among videographers. And I have it set on to kick in at a lower percentage, and that can be determined by this additional setting right here is when do you want your zebra levels to start showing? Preference, again, some people have it up as high as 95 or 100%. So the audio setting, if this isn't turned to your video record feature in your drive modes, you're not going to see this. And we have internal mic level controls both for internal microphone and external microphone. So the camera will realize when we plug in an external microphone and we have it set up, it will recognize it and flip over to that microphone. The idea on this is that you want these on manual. Definitely, if they are turned to auto, what will happen is the camera will fluctuate the gain of the audio signal and it'll be all over the place and very hard to clean up and make it sound good. We typically want to stay just under the red. We kind of want to maximize this range here when we do not want our audio clipping out. So if you see this, what we can do is we can turn down the gain. In this case, I'm gonna turn it way down and I can snap my fingers and you can see it's barely clipping out. So that's the idea is that when we're recording video, we wanna keep an eye on our levels. This is for the internal microphone. If I come back, we can also do this for the external microphone. Always wanna be on manual here. It's not plugged in, so it's not, nothing's happening right now. So the mic level limiter is essentially preventing the microphone from clipping out. I personally turn it off because I think it sounds weird when you get lots of limiting, it's better to adjust the levels. Wind filter, never's worked for, it's never worked for me on any camera, so I don't use that either. Low cut filter removes lower frequency sounds. So we're talking about from 20 to 100 Hertz, for example. And I wouldn't re recommend turning this on because the male voice range kind of goes from about 60 and up. So. If you cut this off, uh, lower sounds are, are going to be removed, and I just don't think it's a good idea. So headphone volume, we can control how loud we hear the audio coming out. And I think that's it on this one. So you'll notice we only have one port on the side of our camera here, and this allows us to determine whether we're going to use it as a microphone port or a, re a release port. 
So we have to come in here and basically say we want to use it as a microphone. And that's how it works. So there's just not a lot of features in terms of plugging in and things of that nature. One question this brings up is what about the headphone jack? The headphone jack actually works through the USB port and you have to get an adapter for that in order to make it work. There's a number of different brands out there. I think they're like 15 or 20 bucks. So the time code setting, obviously if you do a lot of videography, you are going to have a preference where you can have time codes, free run, things of that nature, record run. They're here. You can start the time setting probably beyond the scope of what a beginning or intermediate videographer would worry about. And so those settings are here if you need them or want them. The tally light F front R rear, it basically is going to toggle light when video recording is happening. So whether you're in front of the camera or behind the camera, you can see it, turn them both on. The little sun icon means it's blinking. So the solid circle is it's steady. The one with the little sun rays means it's a blinking light. So if you want them both flashing, you come and choose this. Movie silent control allows us to use the touch screen to change some of the settings like aperture and shutter speed and things of that nature. So when we turn this on, when we come out to video recording, you see this little tab appear right here on the side. And when we touch that, we have the ability to come in and we can change our shutter speed. So this allows for us to use the touch monitor instead of using a knob or a control that might create vibrations and be picked up by a microphone attached to the camera. That's the basic idea on it. And we can do it for shutter speed, our f-stops, exposure compensation, ISO. We have it for our, our microphone levels, the wind filters, our headphone jack, film simulations, and white balance. We can come in here and well, let me swipe. Yep. So we can do all these controls by just touching on the screen and moving it around this way. It's very nice. So I'm gonna come back, go into the menu, and I'm gonna turn that off. Now we're getting in to these, the setup tab. It's the wrench with the blue icon. There's a lot of information in here. There's no way I could cover everything. I've tried to point out some of the more important things in the beginning. You know, So when we come into user setting, format is going to cleanly wipe your memory card. We can set up the date and time. You can have a, uh, a local time and a business time if you do traveling between two time zones a lot. Your language can be determined in here, five pages of languages. Your My Menu setting, which is this final tab on the bottom, allows us to add specific features that we use more. So I might want to have the movie mode and add this to My Menu tab. So you can see this checkbox. And I can add more items to this. And then when this all set up, I can rank those items. I can change the order. I can remove the items. Let's just add one more for the sake of demonstration. We'll go high speed recording. Hit OK. Hit the checkbox. So I'm going to go back, go back. And now we should have something on our My Menu tab, which is the next tab. And this allows us to basically keep our favorites. It's a favorite tab for the, the items that we access the most. We can come in and see the shutter count. We have the sound in the flash noise. We can come in here and turn this off. We can reset the camera settings to basically set up either just the menu or a full setup re reset. I wouldn't recommend doing this if you have it you know, your camera dialed in a certain way, but there are cases like if you were to sell your camera, you might want to do that. Coming down. So we have some different types of electronics certifications. They don't really do anything. This is just displaying those icons. Sound setups. This is where we control all of the sounds from autofocus to the timer, the operation of the camera. You can see mine's turned off. You know, the shutter sound, playback volume, anything dealing with audio, you can, de can determine the levels and whether it's on or off here. Our screen setup determines the things like the brightness. So EVF is talking about our little viewfinder, and the LCD is the back. We can control the brightness, the color. It's like if you're shooting outside and it's really bright, and we want to be able to see the screen, we might have to come in here and turn this up to be brighter or 
we're shooting it and it's dark, we may want to turn it down. We have the color. If you want to play the image back right after shooting, you can choose either half or 1.5 seconds or to leave the image on continually. So much information in here. Auto rotate, I definitely recommend leaving on. We talked about preview for exposure and white balance. Natural live view, if you turn this on using a film simulation, we would see it as we're shooting it. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna to have to skim through a lot of this. Uh, the important things in here, so focus scale units, the large indicators are very handy if you have, uh, you know, if you are corrective eyewear and you need to see them. I demonstrated those a little bit. And a lot of these, some of these are kind of like really fine nuanced settings. Button dial setup. The focus lever setting is this guy right here. It's the joystick, and I, I recommend leaving it on on. But if you want to lock it, you can come in here and definitely lock it or require a push into the camera body to unlock it. But in, in the regular flow of shooting, it's just easier to have direct control of your focusing square. Some really important things are when we're talking about the quick menu is that we can determine how many slots we want to have available when we're customizing it. We have the ability to determine the background of our Q menu using this Q button. It can be a black background or it can be transparent. The FN function settings, we've talked a little bit about. It's the customizations of the buttons. This is very useful. I think the touch function swipes are a little oversensitive, but this allows us to determine how our custom buttons are working. The command dial setting should be simple. It can be very confusing. The idea on this is that we can use our front and rear control wheels to change things like our f-stop, our aperture, our shutter speed, ISO, exposure compensation. The easiest way for me to explain this in, in what is the most one of the most frustrating things in setting up a Fuji camera is that I like having the, the manual control ring. That's how I use it. But some people, they prefer using the front dial. So if you're in manual mode and you try to use that front dial, it's not gonna change anything. When we're doing it with shutter speed, exposure compensation, or you know things of that nature, you're going to see a little C icon, which stands for custom or command. So when we take our ISO and we put it to the C icon, or if we take our exposure compensation, we put it to the C icon, or when we take our, for example, our shutter speed and put it to T, for example, then we can change these settings. So let me sh let me demonstrate how this works real quick. I will put ISO onto the C icon. I'll put this guy to the C icon. So now in this position where we've done the Cs, you can see we get these control wheels. It's basically saying the rear control wheel will do shutter speed, the front control wheel will do ISO, right? So when we come back and I'm rotating the front control wheel, I have ISO, rear control wheel does shutter speed. And people are like, well, what about aperture? This is, this is the, one of the most confusing things about Fuji, some Fuji cameras, is that in order to get this control for our aperture, we would have to know that a few menu items down there's this thing called aperture ring settings that when we're set to auto, it's automatic. But if you want our uh, ring control, it would be on command. So, so once we turn that on to command, so in order to make this work, it wants it to be the aperture ring to be on A. And we get this prompt here that we can use the front control wheel to change a number of settings. So when I press it into the camera body, you can see the highlight jumping to aperture. See where the little half, half moon icon is? I push it into the camera body, and now I'm back at ISO. So depending on how we have the camera set up, we can use our front control wheel by pushing it into the camera body to jump between those three settings, f-stops, exposure compensation, or the ISO. And it, this is just a preference thing. I like the physical con controls a little bit more. But this is how we would set it up, is if that you want those controls, you would move it to the C icon. And when I move it away from custom on exposure compensation, push into the camera body, you can see that that menu has disappeared. Now we're just bouncing back and forth between aperture and ISO. So our shutter halfway depression autofocus, we can remove that 
during either AFS mode or AFC mode. So like if you're a sports shooter and you prefer back button focus, you could come in here and turn this off. It's basically where you set it up. And we could also do the same with using a halfway shutter button depression to determine our auto exposure. So in these modes, single focus, manual focus, it's on, and we can tweak it how we want. Kind of a really nuanced thing. Shoot without card. You can actually take a picture without having a memory card in there. That's what you want to do. The direction of the focus ring, we can change it. We can be it, we can have it non-linear or linear. That's basically the sensitivity. And when we rotate it, do you want it to be very sensitive or not so much? The control ring um, in this instance is the ring on the lens. It's the front of the lens. And when we have it to a standard setting, it's going to operate as it should for manual focusing and things of that nature. If we wanted it to change white balance or some of these other guys, we could do that as well. So the idea on this is that when we're dealing with a standard setting, it's the digital zoom. Basically, it's going to allow us to crop in on our image. But if we wanted it to control, say, white balance, we would select this. And when we rotate that control ring, you can see that it pulls up the white balance menu. So that's the idea in terms of determining how this control ring works. Just for the sake of time, we're gonna skip over some of these. We have our aperture control ring. We talked about that. If you want to go back to the auto mode, then you would come back and select this. Touch screen, we talked about. In some cases, you're gonna to wanna to turn them off. I found the touch function to be a little bit oversensitive and I was accidentally turning these guys on. So if you don't want the touch screen working, you can turn it off completely. Double tapping on the monitor. When this is turned on, we'll zoom in on your subject. And we have some of these other features we talked about. Do you want your touch screen sensitive during playback? Things of that nature. The lock feature allows us to determine certain features that will not operate from bumping, for example. Right now it's in the unlock position. If we had our camera set up a very specific way that we didn't want to change anything, we could lock all functions, or we could come in and lock selected functions. So when we lock selected functions, we have to come in through this list and choose from five, five pages of items we would, we would want to lock when that is selected. Power management is basically allowing us to determine when the camera turns off. We have our performance boost. We have our EVF performance if we want it to be brighter or more smoother as we're transitioning from exposures. Save data setup deals with certain settings when we're saving files, for example. If we change our memory cards, do we want those numbers to be sequential or renew? We also have the ability to edit the file name. We can select our folders. We can deal with our copyright information if we want to tag that into the metadata. It's all done here. Save original image. This is you know, one of the things that's frustrating. This is to save the original image when using the red eye removal tool, and there's no reference to this here, but that's what it is. And then we have our different connection settings, talking about Bluetooth, connecting to a printer, USB power supply. So if you wanted to charge your camera, you know, through the USB port, we have general camera settings. There's a ton of information, geotagging, obviously beyond the scope of what I can do, you know, in, in a video that I'm trying to keep under an hour and a half. We can reset our wireless settings. Um, and then we're at, we're at the back of the top of the menu again. So tons of information. I know I skimmed over some of the less important things. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a quick overview of the deep menu system of the Fuji X100V. Let's talk about connecting to our Wi-Fi app. You're going to need to download the Cam Remote Fujifilm app. So after you've downloaded your app, the Fujifilm app to your smartphone, what we're going to want to do is pair it through Bluetooth just to identify the two. And we're gonna come on and go to pairing registration. So we have our cameras detected. We're going to hit that. So it wants to pair through Bluetooth before we get into the Wi-Fi stuff. Just for the sake of identification, it's, it notices it, it recognizes it. If you try to do this without going through the Bluetooth, you might run into some problems. So we're going to hit start. And another thing, do you want to set the date and time? Well, sure, we'll hit OK. And so at this point, now that they've been paired, we could come into the live view shooting. It should work, but you'll notice that we don't have the Wi-Fi signal right here. And it's basically saying, do you want to join the Wi-Fi? 
You can also pair to Wi-Fi by exiting and going into your smartphone Wi-Fi settings and looking for the Fuji camera app. And at this point, now we are set up and you notice it connected pretty smoothly. So the short answer on this is you're gonna want to pair through Bluetooth first and then connect with your Wi-Fi. And once you've done that, now we can come in and change our exposure. This is the shutter speed, hit okay. So we got our shutter speed, we have our aperture that we can change, right? We can change our ISO, or auto ISOs, or we can just dial in the specific ISO that we want. And this works for a distance of typically, it's about 20 to 30 feet is what we're looking at. We can do film or the different film simulations here if we wanted to. Our white balance is a little off, so we'll go to auto white balance just for the sake of this demonstration. So it gives us exposure controls, white balance controls. We have the ability to go to video recording mode if we wanted to. We can start and stop video recording. There are a couple other cool features. We get some of our just basic information indicators, but when we're ready to download, we can hit this top corner icon. We can see that we've shot video. So we got a little video camera icon. We have our still images. We can select images for the sake of time. I'm going to, just going to demonstrate with the still image and import them. And so what will happen is those images will download to our phone. And now I have the ability to put them on the internet and things of that nature. I'm gonna hit okay. It's gonna take longer for the video, obviously. We're gonna close this out. It's still downloading. Yeah, we'll hit okay. Some other things we have built into the app is we can come into the settings menu. There's a couple things in here you might wanna take a look at. And uh, this is where the good stuff is, the live view shooting. There's also a remote app that we can use, you know, if you just wanna have like a remote trigger. But that is the Fujifilm app, how you connect to it. You're gonna pair first with Bluetooth and then you're gonna go through Wi-Fi, and then you should be good to go. Something that's interesting about the Fuji X100V is that it has a fixed lens. However, there are some teleconverters that you can buy that will change the effective focal length and gives us some options beyond just the built-in lens. One accessory you're definitely going to need to get at some point is a tripod. If you're doing long exposures or if you're doing video recording, you need some sort of a setup that allows you to put the camera in place. A couple of the popular brand names are the Mi Photo and the Manfrotto B-Free tripods. I like the carbon fiber ones. They can be a little bit more expensive. If you're looking to save some money, I carry an aluminum tripod. It appears to be made by the same manufacturer as the ones who are making the Mi Photos, and I'll put that link in the description as well. If you see yourself getting into video recording, two accessories that you will definitely need are number one, a headphone jack, and we don't have one built into our camera, but there is a USB dongle that converts into a headphone jack that you can get. I will put the best one that I can find in the description below. You're also going to want to get an external microphone. The microphone built into the camera isn't really great. And for this reason, I actually went out, did some research, and I have my own microphone manufactured. It's called the Maven Mini Mic. It's $50. You're going to save a ton of money. It's very tough. It has great audio quality. It has a wider frequency range than the competing microphones out there. And this is something that I absolutely approve. You can throw it in your camera bag. You're going to have to worry about it breaking. There is also an additional Maven Mini Mic Pro mount that will allow you to have two additional cold shoes. So if you need to put a wireless pack on there or maybe a small light, things of that nature, I will put that link in the description as well. And probably the most important accessory that you can invest in is right here. Your knowledge, check out the digital photography crash course. If you are brand new to photography, it'll make all these other terms we've talked about. It'll make a lot more sense in terms of shutter speed, aperture, depth of field, composition, things of that nature. Again, a huge shout out to Lens Pro to Go for providing the Fuji X100V used in this video. Paul, thank you so much. Maven 10 will save you 10% at checkout. In any event, I hope you enjoyed this course on the Fuji X100V. I'm Michael Andrew. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.